Thank you. Okay, so welcome to this panel, Return to Crisis, Loknath Swami and Child Abuse in ISKCON, um, with Sarah Jones, Amanda Lucia, KD McComb, Sanya Nilsson can't be here, but Christy will be reading on her behalf. So we will start with uh, Sarah, over to you. Um, can everyone hear me? You can hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so my name is Sarah Jones and I was born into ISKCON, also called the Hare Krishnas in 1978. I grew up hearing stories of abuse from my peers. So um, it's always stuck with me. And when the case of Lokanath Swami came up, um, I became an activist along with KD and a few others in ISKCON. Uh, so here's my paper. The Making of a Child Molester Guru, the Lokanath Swami case, 1990 to 2022. Mm. Um, I sexually abused her, Lokanath Swami. I want to see Lokanath Maharaj off the hook and these sad events buried in the past, Bajra Narayan. I cannot imagine just casually listing Lokanath Maharaj as a sexual abuser, Bajra Narayan. This paper will examine how Lokanath Swami, after sexually abusing a child, rose to be one of the most powerful leaders in ISKCON. Lokanath Swami's rise in ISKCON was done through an ongoing cover-up by certain members of the ISKCON Governing Body Commission, GBC, by the GBC's active disregard of their own child protection laws and from a general apathy of ISKCON members. Um, can you guys see the, my slides? Um, I, so I made you the co-host, so you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Um, trying to see where I do that. Um, so at the bottom, it says share screen. Can you see that button on your screen? Yes. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> okay, so this paper will examine how Lokanath Swami, after sexually abusing a child, rose to be one of the most powerful leaders in ISKCON. Lokanath Swami's rise in ISKCON was done through an ongoing cover-up by certain members of the ISKCON Governing Body Commission. GBC by the GBC's active disregard of their own child protection laws and from a general apathy of ISKCON members. The cover-up started in 1992 when Lokanath's abuse was disclosed and has spanned 30 years and counting. In 1990, 41-year-old Lokanath Swami stayed with a family in New Jersey. While the father was at work and the mother was cooking for Lokanath Swami and his personal assistant, the youngest child, an 11-year-old girl, was home on spring break. Lokanath Swami groomed and molested her over the course of his week-long stay. The girl told her mother and sister immediately, and two years later, the family told the ISKCON GBC, who confirmed the abuse, but then broke their own child protection policies and kept Lokanath Swami in power. There are three perfect storm factors that identify a religious culture or community as authoritarian. One, the culture has a strict social hierarchy. Two, the culture is fearful. And three, the culture is separatist. The more intense these three factors are, the more authoritarian the culture is, the more likely children will be harmed. In ISKCON, there is a Sanskrit term called Vaishnav Aparad. Vaishnav meaning devotee of Vishnu and Aparad meaning offense. In ISKCON, there is a fear of being considered offensive when speaking out against child abusers. Members in ISKCON speaking out against child abuse have been accused of Vaishnav Aparad and have had their character and credibility dismissed or worse, silenced and rejected by friends, family, and leaders. This is more likely to happen if the child abuser is an ISKCON leader and someone with power, control, and connections with other ISKCON leaders. 
One of Lokanov's supporters said, please give up your envy, beg Lokanov's pardon and save yourself from the dire consequences of your Vaishnav aparads. In 1993, a secret seven member GBC committee convened. This committee compiled a report minimizing the details of the abuse and told the recipients of the memo, the other GBC members, to erase this message after reading it. This was the start of an ongoing cover-up that has persisted to this day. At the end of the 1993 confidential memo containing the report, it was written, an apology was made by letter and in person to the girl and the family. They were satisfied. Actually, the family was not satisfied. The written apology was refused by the victim's family. And when Lokanov came to apologize to the victim in person, she asked if he would tell his disciples what he did. He answered that he could not tell his disciples that it would cause them more pain than it had caused her. She ran out of the room crying. Sudamani, wife of GBC member Ravindra Svarup, was at the in-person apology and said that she hugged her and could feel her shake. The victim said publicly in 2010, I never let it go and I never ever thought it was right or okay. The victim and her family had been promised by Ravindra Svarup in 1994 that in exchange for not reporting the sexual abuse to law enforcement, Lokanath would never hold a prominent position in ISKCON again. However, Lokanath has held many prominent positions in ISKCON since, as well as being an initiating guru and a sannyasi, renounced order of life and revered status in ISKCON, Lokanath was appointed by the GBC in various minister positions since his sexual abuse of a child in 1990. And there's a list of the various minister positions. Angry that Lokanath was still being promoted within ISKCON as a spiritual leader, the victim said in 2010, we were promised that Lokanath would be punished. He was not. Lokanath's punishment was that he delay accepting new disciples for two and a half years. He was never removed from leadership and was continuously honored, worshiped and revered as a spiritual leader. The victim also said, I hated him when I had to see him in public and to see that this was his punishment being given articles to write in BTG, being given accolades as a guru, getting all the privileges of a sannyasi. This was what his punishment was. Like other religious institutions, ISKCON has a history of protecting child abusers through cover-up and intimidation of those who speak out. Dira Govinda, who established in 1998 the ISKCON Child Protection Office, CPO, said, even at the beginning of the CPO, the GBC had too much influence in the abuse process through cronyism. It was clear that if there were high profile cases that the GBC could get involved and shut down the judicial, judicial system. One ISKCON member, Jayasachi Sutta, was harassed by GBC members when he served as a judge for high profile child abuse cases. By their own laws, GBC members are not allowed to intervene in child abuse cases, but certain GBC members would intimidate and harass Jayasachi Sutta so that he would give leniency to one of their high profile friends who was accused of child abuse. One particular GBC member was upset that a decision on her friend did not go the way she wanted. So she fabricated stories about his past and teamed up with other ISKCON leaders to spread these rumors within the North American ISKCON leadership circle. He said, they made my life miserable. Vir Krishna Goswami is an ISKCON GBC member, sannyasi and guru who has been involved in Lokanath's cover-up since 1992. He told one of his female disciples in 2015 to be silent on Lokanath's child molestation and that if she is bothered by Lokanath's presence, then she should avoid him. Lokanath Swami is not the first child abuser that Vir Krishna Goswami actively covered up. In 2009, Vir Krishna Goswami concealed a child abuser in the United States an abuser who had previously sexually abused a child in another country. After Beer Krishna Goswami hid the abuser's past from families in his community, the man then sexually assaulted a two-year-old. Because of this, the ISKCON GBC issued a public censure to Beer Krishna Goswami in 2011 saying, you failed to properly report the incident to local authorities or later to the CPO. Most significantly, the local community and householders were not notified or made aware of this potential threat. This put the community at risk and created serious potential exposure to repetition of these incidents. In 2021, Vir Krishna Goswami's female disciple that he had previously silenced in 2015 was speaking out publicly on the Lokanath case. Vir Krishna Goswami asked her to stop because her comments were 
disturbing the disciples of Lokanath. Dear Govinda said about Bir Krishna Goswami, during my tenure as director of the ISKCON Child Protection Office, 1998 to 2004, practically in every instance where Bir Krishna Goswami involved himself in any way with child protection cases, he did a huge disservice to children, parents, and families. He showed himself to be consistently irresponsible, actually placing practically no value on the principle of personal accountability or organizational responsibility, corrupt, manipulative, lacking any semblance of genuine caring or even basic common sense. Wherever he touched, we needed to follow up with damage control. Dear Govinda, previous CPO director said in a 2020 interview, I lost some inspiration to do the investigations and adjudications because there was appallingly little culture of systemic accountability. And so we could go through a whole investigation and adjudication, but if the accused was a friend of someone in an influential position, then it could be summarily disregarded. One month after Bir Krishna Goswami wrote to his female disciple asking her to again remain silent, Bir Krishna Goswami's other male disciple wrote to her asking her also to remain silent and threatening that she will get some kind of reaction if she does not remove her post about Lokanath Swami, that he knows for certain she is endangering her relationship with Krishna, Guru, and the Vaishnavas, and she is committing Vaishnav Aparad. We regularly see this term Vaishnav Aparad be used against child protection advocates who are told they are offending if they speak out against a child abuser. GBC member Anutama, who is in charge of ISKCON communications, told me, I humbly suggest that at this point we need fewer strident voices, referring to me and the other child protection advocates. Anutama also said, as you must know, there are other opinions and other voices with equal or greater intensity than yours, referring to the supporters of Lokanath who supposedly speak with more intensity and should therefore be listened to. Um, looks like my time is up. So I was just gonna go through the different threats that the supporters, Lokanath supporters have been threatening the victim's family and the child protection advocates. Um, so one supporter called the victim's sister and brother-in-law and said, I'm going to F your daughter. The daughter was six. Um, one child protection advocate who runs a Hare Krishna school in India was threatened by an ISKCON temple president in India. If your husband was alive, he could stop you by doing such demonic activities. By doing this, you will not be able to live in Vrindavan. And then various other threats we've gotten. Um, may there be bugs in your mouth. Uh, the consequences of leaving the post up will be very bad. Um, they need the right stick for demons like Sarah and Damodar and KD. And then another email I got, um, this is your one and only warning, back off, oh stupid one, you do not know what you are dealing with. Remember you have until July 20th and I press the red button and will unleash your worst nightmares on you. This was so Lokanath could have his lavish birthday party. And in closing, Lokanath Swami's public stature, fame and connection to disciples, donors and projects is why he has been given preferential treatment and why his sexual abuse of a child has evaded ISKCON's own child protection rules and policies. In the 30 years since he has sexually abused a child, his power within ISKCON has only grown. And with that power comes people who will go to great lengths to protect him. For ISKCON to be seen as moral and ethical, the leaders must follow their child protection laws and policies for all child abusers, including and especially the leaders. The leadership needs to be more vocal in stamping out misinformation and not be easily swayed by those fighting to keep child abusers in power. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I think we'll do questions for everyone at the end, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see. Stop sure.
Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Saraswati. Um, I wanted to discuss, um, I wanted to discuss more of the system uh, that supports and enables abuse within ISKCON. So um, I am discussing the governing body commission of ISKCON, wielding the power of God. My name is KD, um, stands for Krishna Devata, my birth name. And um, as an adult child of the Hare Krishnas, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, ISKCON, I have witnessed deep devotion and faith alongside absolute abuse of power, gurus seemingly endowed by God and worshiped like God. The GBC functions, uh, all the functions of the institution are directed by the governing body commission, the GBC, which has been tasked with the management of the Hare Krishna movement. The GBC has the power to approve or remove sannyasis, monks, also called swamis or maharajas, and gurus. The gurus create disciples by initiating newcomers with the vows of Vaishnava practices and an oath of eternal bond between guru and disciple. Okay. I wanted to share a, this, so this is not an organizational chart. This is my um, drawing of power. Um, the power uh, from, you know, if the last presentation we were in with the lawyers talks about reputational protection. So you might not be able to read that, but the flag on the temple is says reputation. <laughs> and yes, oh, sure, thank you. So my my uh, metaphor of the power. So the GBC really upholds the power of the gurus. While the GBC has the responsibility to oversee the entire society, protecting women and children has rarely been the priority. The gurus and GBC have built towering temples while countless children have suffered. First-time guests are often prioritized as potential disciples while neglecting social development needs of families and communities. The GBC have the task of giving sanction to men who have worked their way up through the bureaucracy, like you can see uh, the different programs, temples and um, preaching programs, festivals, and uh, prashadam means food, the food distribution and book distribution. And darshan means like viewing God in the temple. So, and kirtan is like the singing and dancing. So all of these public shows. Um, the GBC have the task of giving sanction to men who worked their way through the bureaucracy to the elevated status of guru. These men, Sannyasis and gurus are a protected class. They're also wearing uh, the saffron robes. So they're very distinctive and there's a lot of etiquette associated with uh, even in coming encounter with them. Once in those positions, they are protected by the often cited and misapplied Bhagavad Gita verse, chapter nine, verse 30. Even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. In this way, once a member is considered so advanced and qualified to be elevated to the status of sannyasi or guru, their discrepancies and abuses of power, people and children, are excused and dismissed as accidental fall downs, while those who question and challenge these actions are demonized and discredited as offensive criticizers. 
the victims or whistleblowers are punished and marginalized in a society. Therefore, a man could achieve a position as a guru or sannyasi, a position of public trust with access to all members of ISKCON with predatory intent and actions while apparently protected by the words of the Gita. What about the disciples? This is a question that is often spoken to victims or advocates. The question, what about the disciples, is posed when it is suggested that a guru should be removed from his position. But the question is built on the premise that the disciples are helpless victims of critics who will be lost if uh, lost without their great guru. It poses the burden of responsibility on the vi victims or advocates to empathize with the disciples as a common gaslighting tactic. In this way, the more gurus, the more disciples a guru has, the more they are protected from challenges as the institution sees any ethical intervention as a threat to the figurehead of the institution and his followers. The GBC, rather than acting as mandated reporters of child abuse, circumvent the law and their own child protection policies and pr practice a de facto qualified immunity for sannyasis to abuse children in temples, ashrams, and programs. According to ISKCON's resolutions and policy, the case of Lokana Swami should be reviewed by their Child Protection Office, but it has been diverted for 30 years. Due to public pressure, they assigned an ad hoc GBC panel just recently, which is set to further, which will set further precedent for the GBC to intervene on their own child protection process. The case of Lokna Swami undermines all the child protection endeavors in ISKCON for the last 30 years. Tasked as the managerial authority of ISKCON, the GBC has taken extra judicial action on, in the Lokanath case by intervening directly with the victim, by using women under their direction as supposedly compassionate advocates, or through intimidation tactics by influential men. Defending the perpetrator by hiring or appointing mental health professionals to contrive explanations for sexual molestation and covering up abuse through secret orders by their executive committee and secret resolutions by vote by their legislative body. The GBC has repeatedly acted as defense, judge, and jury of sannyasis, gurus, and gurus who are child abusers while maintaining friendships with them rather than report abuse to law enforcement or removing them from their thrones. The past. Since the class action lawsuit by the adult children of Krishna, who named ISKCON as responsible for the international epidemic of child abuse that happened in many Gurukula boarding schools, many people insist that things have changed. People say things have changed since those days when children were systematically beaten and raped behind closed doors by teachers and sannyasis when children were separated from their families to indoctrinate them in ashram boot camp conditions. Certainly, since Gurukula boarding schools were closed, direct brutality towards the children have been, has been reduced. However, all the values and contorted philosophy conjured to rationalize child abuse and neglect still remain. And I'll add that also the onus of responsibility for protecting children is directly placed on the parents. So the institution avoids responsibility for any of that now. ISKCON has proven that they will protect their reputation and the glory of the gurus, even if that means silencing the voices of abused children 
or twisting and weaponizing sacred words to rationalize lifelong harm against the most vulnerable. Many people think the problem was solved when hundreds of victims were given a bankruptcy settlement to the class action lawsuit. The massive court case did not produce any healing justice. It perpetuated the silencing and erasure of the abuse with all the details sealed in a closed case an entire, and an entire generation marginalized. The creation of the Child Protection Office was ISKCON's attempt to resolve their heinous mistakes with the Gurukulas. However, the CPO is grossly underfunded, undermined, and politically bullied by the GBC. As long as the GBC can intervene in CPO investigations, children will not be safe in ISKCON. Broken families. Since detachment from material bondage was heavily preached, healthy family relationships were often diminished as mundane illusions. Women were told that they must get married, but men were told that they should try to remain celibate. Parents were pressured to turn their children over to the institutional boarding schools so the women could return to more important services. Family needs were interrupted by community needs and children were displaced and parental figures replaced by the institution's mostly unqualified teachers. Children were sent for Gurukula education that oftentimes broke their spirits, their hearts, excuse me, and sometimes their bones. Some of these people are dear to us. An entire generation has been wounded and lost. Milk touched by the lips of a serpent becomes poison. This is a term that um, is used to, oops, can somebody help me? Oh, there we go. So um, this is a term, uh, milk touched by the lips of a serpent becomes poison, is uh, a metaphor I'm using to describe the spiritual abuse. Sacred teachings were often used as psychological abuse, but the toxic messages were delivered with words like surrender and humility and loyalty. Spiritual teachings were laced with nuances meant to shame, silence, control, and to bypass doubts or questions of accountability, misconduct, or abuse. The use of spiritual words and phrases to execute psychological coercion, manipulation, or punishment is incredibly damaging to the mind and spirit of any child or sincere seeker. I should add that many adults also have been abused by these same tactics. I will share some common examples from my experience in ISKCON. There's a common phrase, not a blade of grass moves without the will of the Lord to find comfort in the divine order of the unfolding. However, when the same phrase is weaponized and used by an abuser or an abusive institution to explain or rationalize abuse, it becomes a means to gaslight silence and divert responsibility from the abuser and blame the victim. The victim of this kind of spiritual abuse may become confused and compliant because they accept the first premise out of faith by the will of the Lord. However, that message is laced with a deep psychological poison. You are abused and suffer by the will of God. Another common phrase, you are not this body, you are not your body. It is a, a reference to the Sanskrit phrase, aham brahmasmi, that can be more accurately translated as I am spirit soul. While removing of physical identity can be transcendental, it is often used as a means of erasure or denial of bodily and emotional needs. It is your karma. This is another common phrase, blaming and shaming the victims for their suffering, rationalizing the abuse, often leaving victims powerless. 
the same principle of karma never seems to be brought up to discuss accountability and consequences for the abusive members of ISKCON. Though many social needs go unattended in temples and congregational communities, all the glory and goals of the society serve the best possible public image and functions of the institution, including the gurus as symbols of God. Anyone who questions or expects accountability from leadership is demonized and scapegoated for trying to destroy ISKCON. Vedic rulers. Vedic culture is glorified and held up as an aspirational social order. Vedic emperors were measured by, their, by the well being of the most vulnerable living entities under their reign and protection. Though they held tremendous power, their pious and generous devotional values decorated them as righteous well wishers for everyone in the kingdom. The GBC and gurus have long promoted Vedic culture yet they repeatedly failed to see their responsibility in protecting children. Unlike Vedic culture, sannyasis and gurus occupy the GBC att uh, actually attempt to fulfill multiple roles, mixing together the roles of spiritual advisors with the managerial roles analogous to that of kings. This is a scramble of the social order they admire and they have failed to be either effective or ethical in their use of the Vedic model as a means to deliver justice for children. Women and girls. A girl child is low in the measure of value in the eyes of these men. Women in ISKCON are referred to as mother, but not usually respected for their contributions. They are expected to be chaste wives, otherwise they are literally called prostitutes. Women are considered in need of protection by a man, by her husband, father, or son. Their karma becomes eternally linked to her husband, and thus she is not considered a fully sovereign soul. Though the protection of women is touted in this way, Gender segregation is practiced strictly for the benefit and protection of celibate men. Women shall not disrupt the concentration or disturb the lust of men who easily fall victim to the temptation of maya or illusion, which is a feminine word. Women are blamed for a celibate man's fall down. The sexualized and demonized bodies of women and girls are fully covered and separated. However, it is common and normal for men to enter the areas designated for women and children. Gurus and sannyasis arriving in those spaces are seen as mercy for their female followers or dismissed as innocent intrusions. The segregation of women and children does not protect them, but often leaves them vulnerable and marginalized. When mothers are stripped of their capacity to assert their voices and leadership, the protection of, for their children is also diminished. The temple doors open to all, but doors close to protect those in leadership and authority and leave children and families out with the shoes, sometimes very literally. ISKCON society is organized and groomed to emphasize and empathize with celibate men. The father figure. Recently, Satsrup Das Goswami posted a public apology to the students of the first Gurukula in Dallas. He said, my guilt is not so much what I did, but what I didn't do. I didn't play with you or hug you. I didn't act as your close friend or surrogate father. So he did not recognize the violent offenses of the adults against the children and chose to blame the severe abuse on the children's non natural rambunctiousness. He did not report the abuse to police, nor did he rectify it directly with Srila Prabhupada when he was still alive. 
There are so, several gurus who continue to demonstrate public displays of physical affection and attention for children as a message of mercy and benevolence. However, it conveys a dangerous elimination of boundaries for the benefit of amplifying the influence of the guru at the cost of protecting children. So there's a lot of like public displays of affection to these children and it's, it's dismissed as cute, but it's a big uh, breach of sannyas conduct. Thank you. Gurus and sannyasis who install themselves as father figure in the children's lives is not a correct role of a leader or sannyasi. Professional codes of conduct should be accepted into our social norms. Sannyasis who want to hug children and teens like a magnanimous father should step down to proper family life. The new generations are attempting to reinvent the movement. Unfortunately, this rebranding represents an erasure of history, the abuse of the Gurukula generation, and an entrenchment of systems of power that continue to protect and promote abusers. ISKCON aims to shed its history of caricaturized airport pop culture joke and the child abuse lawsuit that landed ISKCON in the media to emerge as a present day yoga culture with rebranded preaching efforts like destination retreats, podcasts, lifestyle influencers and coaches. And there's uh, a few other relevant current examples um, of the Bhakti Center who continues to promote Dhanadar Swami, who is a notorious child abuser, one of the number one, he was the number one child abuser named in the class action lawsuit. And uh, there's also Bhakti Vidya Purna Swami, in Mayapur, which is the seat of the headquarters of the international GBC and ISKCON. Um, so the GBC is being given a choice to protect children or protect abusers. And clearly we see what they're doing. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello, uh, my name is Christina and I'm gonna be reading this paper for Sonia Nielsen who unfortunately couldn't be here today. To understand the unwillingness of many of the leaders as well as members of ISKCON of which you have heard to bring up the Lokanath Swami case, as well as a tendency to let former known abusers partake in worship, we need to take a closer look at what they are in fact fearing. In this presentation, I argue that the leadership of ISKCON is trying to protect the movement at the expense of children, of child protection within the communities as a response to a historical stigmatization of the, of the organization. I understand this as a plausible explanation, not as a justification. Professor of sociology, James T. Richardson, described in his article, definitions of cults from sociological, technical to popular, to popular negative, how the academic sociological concept of cult as an organizational form of religious groups founded by Troch had in recent times come to represent a negative term for religious groups seen as deviant. Richardson art Richardson's article is one in a line of articles written by sociologists of religion during the 1990s, when the polemical position of sociologists of religion on the one hand and representatives for sociological perspectives on the other hand, worried family members and parts of the news media debated the risks of so-called cultish groups. In the wake of this debate, Richardson also noted in his 1999 article, 
in Palmer and Handelman's anthology that the debate had shifted focus since its inception in the early 1970s. In the 1970s, the people who joined so-called cults were largely made up of high school dropouts, young people who are part of the counterculture and looking for radical societal, political, and sometimes spiritual change. Several new religious groups attracted youth. You may recognize the Children of God, later known as the Family, the Unification Church, as well as the Hare Krishna movement. The first so-called anti-cult movement was founded by so-called deprogrammer Ted Patrick as a response of family members of youth who had joined the Children of God. The so-called anti-cult movement was soon joined by family members of members in other perceived religiously deviant groups, including the Hare Krishnas. There's a, a slide where she says, you see here from a talk shown where Ted Patrick argues with two members of ISKCON over whether the group is a cult or not. At this time, the main concern of the family members was that the youth had been what they called brainwashed, that is lured into membership in what the parents perceived as a strange, deviant and dangerous community. The brainwashing theory was used to explain why the youth had suddenly dropped out of their life and their parents that their parents expected them to live, the presumption being that it could not have been out of their own free will. To unwash members' brains, in quotes, a practice of deep programming was used in which members would be forcibly taken or lured away from the group, isolated and exposed to critical views of the group by so-called deep programmers, such as Ted Patrick. The brainwashing theory was debated back and forth during the coming 30 years, and it is still debated today. Not less because sociologists tend to attribute even young adults agency, and there seems to be a wide variety of why, reasons of why young people join groups like these. However, deprogramming is no longer used on a large scale. In the 1980s and 1990s, the young adults who had joined the religious groups had become parents themselves and determined to raise their children in environments into which they had converted and found themselves targeted by the same antagonists from the anti-cult milieu, only now the focus had switched from brainwashed young adults to sexually abused children. During the so-called academic cult wars of the 1990s, some scholars in the sociology of religion put forth the hypothesis that the focus point in, this public, in the public stigmatization of new religious movements had switched from brainwashing narratives in the 1970s and 1980s to accusations of sexual abuse of children. The child abuse awareness regarding new religions coincided with what Philip Jenkins called the child abuse revolution, described in an increasingly, in an increasingly publishing of works about abuse, incest, and sexual exploitation. Some of the critique against this development encompassed the question of recovered memories of child sexual abuse and the so-called satanic panic. At the same time, new religious groups approached scholars of religion and invited them to study their groups as a way of countering these accusations. This led to some great authentic and interesting studies of new religions, but it also led some scholars to be criticized as being subjected to and buying into the impression management of new religious groups. In the case of ISKCON, the organization has a proportionately large number of members, well-educated and working within academia. One well-known and widely criticized publication is the anthology Sex, Slander, and Salvation, Investigating the Children of God, in which scholars of religion, after doing ethnographic research and psychological assessments on children in the group, describe the accusations of child sexual abuse as unfounded. However, rumors persisted, and when young children of the leader in 2006 took his own life and killed one of the group's members, several firsthand accounts of sexual abuse of the second generation came public. Today, most scholars of religion would not dispute that abuse did take place. However, there are varying estimations of how widespread this was. As a result of the claims of child abuse, many new religions have a history of experiencing traumatization traumatizing raids in which the children are separated from their parents as well as a case of members of the children of, as is the case for members of the children of God. However, far from all accusations of child abuse in the groups turned out to be true. Brainwashing claims and child sexual abuse claims are not easily com compared if one is to apply a children's perspective. 
Brainwashing refers to the understanding that significant psychological technique can reduce a person's critical thinking. And in the study of new religions, the anti-cult movement used this theory as an argument to why people would join the new religions. However, the presumption here is that grown up people are easily manipulated as well as an assumption that no person in their right mind would join these groups had it not been for manipulation techniques being implemented as the religious groups are seen as deviant, unreal religion, bad religion, or dangerous. It is thus both a question of agency and authenticity of religion. Child sexual abuse encompasses neither from the perspective neither from the perspective of the child. Regarding brainwashing, it is quite hard to distinguish from, soci from socialization. A child has less autonomy than a grown up, as well as fewer possibilities to reject socialization, whether it be within or outside of a religious faith. If primary as well as secondary socialization takes place within a religious community, the child may have little to no alternate view on religion than that of their parents or caretakers and the community. A child subjected, to child sexual abuse has no means of choosing to participate or not. Hence the question of agency falls and the responsibility of the deed lies solely on the perpetrator. In the field of studies of children in new religions and especially in religious communities that have a strained relationship to mainstream society and or does not have cultural continuation, we have seen that so-called grand narrative of persecution is often present. Due to the stigmatization of new religions, the groups often feel targeted and develop a collective memory as part of the cultural identity, which is socialized from an early age to the children within the community. The collective memory serves as a foundation of cohesion. In many, in my own research into different new religious groups, I have come across the grand narrative of persecution several times. It is often formed around certain leaders of the group and serves as an explanation to all criticism toward the group and even more so against the leader, leaders, whether true or not. While most new religions do not survive the second generation, those who did tended to have a changing impact on their group's policies and practices. In the case of ISKCON, the abuse of the second generation was noticed outside the group by sociologist E. e. Burke Rockford, who contributed greatly by interviewing second generation members about the, their experience in the movement's Gurukula's boarding, Gurukula boarding schools. Following the uncovering of abuse, including the suing and subsequent financial settlement between the organization and victims, ISCON developed what is now known as the Child Protection Office in 1998. As the institution of the Child Protection Office, as a response to the history of abuse became public, it seems as if the history of abuse in the Gurukulas became fixed in time, spoken of as something that took place at a certain time, but was resolved once and for all. In the years following the founding of the CPO, several event offenders were listed by the CPO as abusers, and a screening process of members moving into temple communities was implemented as a result. The idea was to protect the organization's children from exposure to abuse as offenders could just relocate. ISKCON seemed to have finally become the haven for Vaishnava children. At the same time, we know that the ISKCON Child Protection Office's funding was reduced by 97%, between 1998 and today, $150,000 in 1998, 5,000 in 2021. We have seen examples of known abusers partaking in festivals and temple community activities with none of the attending parents having any idea that child sexual offenders were among them. How is this possible? Taking a closer look at the documents outlining the so-called judgments of the offenders reveals a rhetoric that has little to do with protection from a child's perspective. The judgments include, in almost all cases, a limited time of suspension from partaking in the activities of the temple community, like the prohibition initially placed on Lokanath Swami to stop initiating new disciples for three years. And then when he would initiate again, the condition was that he made sure that the prospective disciples had been informed of his suspension for the, and the reasons behind it. In other cases, the conditions to re-enter the temple community reign, the temple community show the ruling from the CPO to the temple president to being forbidden to stay overnight and specific restrictions regarding giving class or leaving Kirtan to writing letters of apology to victims. In most of the cases, the additional condition is given, quote, 
and cannot visit ISCON property or attend an ISCON function if the child sexual abuse victim and his or her family members are present, unless uncovered and without manipulation, they give their consent. This phrasing is interesting. Firstly, not all victims of abuse enjoy having letters from their abusers. Second, the responsibility of being the one who must decide that a certain person is not welcome into the temple weighs heavy on many victims' shoulders. You have heard the presentations of, of the case of Lokanat Swami, who, have, who has over 5,000 followers. Not all abusers have that, but he does. You have heard the presentation regarding the power structure within the organization. Now imagine you, as a former victim of child sexual abuse, must be responsible for asking your own abuser to leave the temple. Thank you. Hello. Sorry, I should have done that before. Um, I'm really here today as in a supporting role. So despite that you've seen me talking all weekend, uh, right now this is really Sarah and Katie and Sanja's uh, authority. Um, so I just want to take a few minutes at the end and, and make a few questions about authority. Um, and I'll just start. So in 2015 or so, something like that, uh, during my first years in LA, I received a surprise invitation to lunch from a GBC member um, who wanted to meet me because I had uh, worked in this field. Um, the lunch went pretty well. We met in downtown LA and, and on the west side. And at the, as things were kind of going well and there was a bit of rapport, I mentioned that I had just finished a book called Monkey on a Stick. Um, and the subtitle is Murder, Madness, and the Hare Krishnas. So from the subtitle, you can guess what the book entails. And I, I with trepidation, said, you know, I'm sure it's all fabricated, right? It's an expose. And he turned to me kind of deadpan and said, no, it's true. And so for the last decade or so, I've been trying to figure out what that is um, and overcome my shock and to look more closely at criminality in contemporary guru movements. So it's an un unacknowledged common feature of many of the most successful guru movements um, with many of the most notorious being ar arrested or extradited if we think about Bhagwan Rajneesh. Um, I was just writing on Nityananda who is actively fleeing Interpol at the moment or even Ashram Bapu who is receiving extraordinary devotions in jail in Jodhpur. So um, that's not to say it's all gurus, but some of the most prominent celebrity gurus are in the media for uh, criminal activity. So in brief, um, many of the builders of the field of what we might imagine to be called guru studies um, don't talk about this. And I've seen that more and more as a kind of academic erasure and a violence that is active in our field. Um, and they turn away from what uh, Robert Orsi has called the quote unquote broken places of uh, the guru field. And um, I think this comes from a lot of different reasons that I won't really get into now, but one of it is cl closeted devotional commitments of a lot of uh, scholars. And, and early in my career, a lot of people would come up to me after I talked and say, are you a devotee? Um, and that's something to acknowledge in, in our field as well. So the Lokanath case, uh, you've already heard quite a bit about it. Um, and I'll try to focus just a little bit here on broader questions that concern the negotiation of authority. Um, and what I've been considering, and this is relatively nascent work, um, is a hypothesis between guru criminality, the law, and negotiations of authority within guru movements. So in short, one of the reasons that gurus engage in criminality is because the law, that is, if we were to say the common law of society, 
has very minimal or even non-existent status in the hierarchy of various authorities um, that govern the Guru community. So in broad strokes, and I'll begin with the um, conviction following Bruce Lincoln that authority is a, an aspect of discourse. And so I'm gonna look at kind of a discursive analysis of some of the different ways in which Lokanath is defended online um, in media. And uh, to note that there are a lot of other authorities beyond common law that are being called upon to justify his actions. His defenders effectively usurp the authority of common law, that fact that child molestation is a punishable criminal act by using other structures of commonly held authority in ISKCON to defend their guru. And this practice reveals the decentralizing and the devaluation of common law is irrelevant or unapplicable to the devotional community. So in order that I don't um, run out of time, I'm gonna kind of give you the, the meat first and then I'll fill in the details later. So we might think about structures of authority um, looking along these lines, like uh, beginning with guru authority and then somewhere in their legal authority, institutional authority, traditional authority, or that would be authority of the broader religion, in this case, Gaudiya Vaishnavism, or perhaps Hinduism, maybe even Indian culture, um, scripture authority, and so on. And then we could put something like ethics or morals or dharma in the middle, like what should I do or what should be done, if you use a kind of Sanskrit formation of that. Um, in the case of Islam, of course, at the top, it would be A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who's at the top as the primary guru authority. Um, you know, then namely authority, and that gets difficult because ISKCON is a global movement, and we just talked about the different legal systems to which they might be accountable. And that might be one of the reasons why the law is not as much of a considerable authority, because you'd have to say whose law and when, right? So is this Indian law, which is different than U.S. law, different from Australian law, depending on where the ISKCON followers might be located. Um, an important here, term here that I use is a shorthand uh, from, the, from the discourses that I've been reading or is, is Malaysia law. So Malaysia is a kind of derogatory term meaning an outsider or a foreigner. And so I'm gonna use that throughout this talk. Um, but moving along the circle then is institutional authority. In the case of ISKCON, that would be the GBC and the ICOCP or the uh, ISKCON Central Office of Child Protection. Um, uh, again, I already mentioned the traditional authority would be Gaudiya Vaishnavism or Hinduism and then scriptural authority. And here we might have the celebrated text of ISKCON and that could be a wide variety of texts, but potentially the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavata Purana, the Mahabharata, and particularly the commentaries that the gurus make on those scriptures. So not those scriptures alone, um, but the commentarial tradition as well. But of course, you know, this is not a circle. <laughs> There's more like a hierarchy happening here where things feed upwards toward the guru. Um, and so we might imagine, and I'm sure other people might negotiate how these things might look differently in order, but the guru at the top, and then the guru's disciples in particular below him in, in kind of order of, of chain of command. And that's where you would have the institutional organizations that we've heard so much about today. Underneath their scriptural um, authority, below their kind of a broader sense of what the tradition might say is correct. And somewhere way at the bottom is Malaysia law or, or what the, the um, secular or common law might look like. So now I just wanna to turn to some evidence of what this, um, this, the discourses surrounding Lokanath sound like. And in conclusion, I'll return a bit to think through these implications for the structure of guru, guru criminality more broadly. Um, but before I kind of start, I wanna say that the Lokanath case can't really be considered outside of the context of the legacy of child abuse in ISKCON. And we've heard quite a bit about that already. So I'll go a little bit um, quickly, but the Gurukulas of course created a, 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 a horrific scandal and, and crisis for the movement in the seventies and eighties um, up until the nineties when the Turley lawsuit was filed in 1998 which exposed systemic child abuse in the Gurukulas. Um, Burke Rochford wrote in 1998 that it was the primary cause for the loss of trust in ISKCON leadership. It not only catalyzed financial bankruptcy, but a quote unquote spiritual bankruptcy among its once ardent devotees that quote, sank ISKCON, the ISKCON movement into a near unrecoverable public relations crisis. In response, uh, 
ISCON founded the Child Protection Office or the CPO to handle allegations of abuse in 97. And then the following year, the Association for the Protection of Vulnerable Children and its role and function, the APVC received dozens of reports documenting the suppression of children's reports of abuse and accounts of how devotee parents felt that they had quote unquote, no choice, but to leave their children in the abusive gurukulas if they were to be considered quote unquote, good devotees. The Turley case or uh, children of ISKCON v. ISKCON settled in 2005 and awarded 9.5 million US to 535 survivors of child abuse from the Gulakula system. ISKCON responded by filing for bankruptcy and the result was a lasting crisis of faith as I've mentioned, but also a monetary award between 2,500 and 50,000 to each student. However, you know, we've seen how while the Turley case um, made significant impact in ISKCON and by the establishment of these office, offices, as Katie and Saraswati have mentioned, there are key guru figures who continue to retain exalted positions, even though there's credible allegations um, that there's uh, abuse and rampant abuse. So if, as Wolf writes, quote, there's incred incredulity from devotees because many leaders who were in authority when the horrendous child abuse happened retain their positions. Um, and blacklists roam the internet. And I had thought to kind of list some of these, but instead I just put up the URLs where you can Google the blacklist of different numbers of gurus who are um, publicized as being uh, abusers. So in the contemporary discursive field on child abuse in ISKCON, it's quite clear at the outset that there's some dangerous conflations that are prevalent in emic discourses surrounding ISKCON and its legacy of child abuse. Um, that can't really be separated from the debates around Lokanath Swami. In general, the field is rife with accusations derived from prejudices related, whether they're related to caste or gender or sexuality or cultural differences. Gurus who are immoral uh, or impure are commonly referred to as having quote unquote shudra qualities, referring to populations occupying the lowest and most quote unquote impure position on the Hindu caste system. There's often a nefarious equivalence made between homosexuality and child abuse. Um, and here's an example of that. I don't wanna leave that slide up too long, but um, you can read the part in yellow where uh, Bhavananda Dasa is accused of not only creating widespread nests of child molesters in ISKCON's India schools, but also accused because if he was visiting gay bars around the world and one of his disciples has already died from the AIDS virus and another associate, oh, another of his associates is HIV positive. Third, there's a kind of conflation that is often racist in its application where the, um, it becomes a conflict between Western devotees and Indian devotees that blames Indians and Indian culture for abuse and blames the guru model as uh, the reason for abuse. And one of the biggest problems with this is that the trope ultimately serves no one because it's easily redeployed to accuse uh, uh, survivors of racism and thus silence critiques and survivors violent experiences. So another aspect of the contemporary debate that I've been noticing is that a debate is framed in polarizing terms. So either A, ISKCON authorities are gurus, or B, ISKCON authorities are child molesters. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a, for example, um, which ISKCON authorities are both gurus and child molesters. That is to say that gurus are in need of some sort of discipline or reform or punishment. So this is kind of a, um, a, a an action or a framing theologically that stymies reform or the possibility of any kind of disruption of a guru figure. Um, and I was noticing that this actually comes from Prabhupada himself. So he was in an interview, um, the reporter says, what about the bad gurus? And he says, and what is a bad guru? The reporter says a bad guru just wants some money or some fame. And Prabhupada says, well, if he's bad, how can he become a guru? How can iron become gold? Actually, a guru cannot be bad. For if someone is bad, he cannot be a guru. So I'm going to go through just a few different kinds of authority and show how it's been applied here. Um, so it's obvious that the current acharyas will always be surrounded with false allegations. 
Here you have the invocation of Kali Yuga, right? Anything bad that happens in the contemporary period in India, oh, it's Kali Yuga, what are you gonna do? Um, uh, also, this is used in contestations over the authority of the GBC and their status as Ritvik Acharyas. So the kind of diffraction from, is this an ethical uh, action on the part of the guru versus is he really a guru? And that's the way that that previous um, kind of commentary on the two categories being mutually exclusive then comes into play because the conversation gets sidetracked away from the action into the status of the person. So then it kind of moves into this whole conversation of, is the G GBC legit? Do they belong? Do they believe, uh, do they uh, deserve to hold the authority of gurus? The question of Ritvik Charyas or that is appointed gurus and whether that is um, traditional or, or um, a responsible, responsible to tradition, its application or not. If you're thinking through institutional authority as well, um, it's important to note that in the Lokanath case, the GBC took control over the investigation from the Child Protection Office in uh, August 25th, 2021, becoming the case of child abuse that has not been adjudicated by the CPO. And so you see the contestations of institutional authority in between the two of those. Um, scriptural authority, I'm gonna bypass that quickly uh, we, because KD did it well, right? Already Bhagavad Gita 9.30 about fall downs. Uh, you also see here, even the adharma performed by your devotees becomes dharma. The other, the last thing I wanna conclude is the kind of um, the weakness and the immorality of outsiders as they're viewed from within ISKCON, and that includes the courts. So I, I thought this was a really interesting quote. So he says, even people who eat hamburgers in the USA know that we cannot worship pedophiles as gurus and messiahs. These India ICC people have a long, long way to go to be as advanced as the hamburger eating and beer drinking people. And if you skip down, that's why it takes so many births to get to Krishna. They will have to be advanced as a hamburger eater before they can progress further. Um, and I was, I was thinking through the ways in which the law is very much not seen to be a moral doctrine from an emic perspective within these aspects because the law is created with its own moral code by hamburger eaters and beer drinkers um, and its own kind of Christian oftentimes in the US inflected moral code. And so, um, it, it's discredited in that way. And that's one of the reasons why I think that uh, it's important to consider the space of the law as outside the moral kind of purview and umbrella of the religious institution. That's why they don't, I got a minute. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. We've got five minutes for questions. So, um, enthusiasm at the back. Hi, um, I first just wanted to thank everyone for their presentations. I know um, a lot of them were a lot uh, to give and we appreciate it. Um, Stacy and I kept nudging each other and looking at each other because of all the similarities between ISCON and 3HO, uh, between internal governing bodies and the boarding schools and everything else. Um, one thing that really struck me um, about Katie and your drawing was the flag at the top, um, and reputation. And uh, Professor Lucia mentioned the different forms of authority and kind of a, a question or a statement for everyone is one of the things that we've thought of repeatedly with 3HO is how so much energy and effort is given to that flag of reputation, how it has perhaps, it is a concern that is equal to scriptural authority, legal authority, guru authority. Um, and, and I wonder if you know, we, can, we can think about that as another thing that's there. Um, I know in the case of 3HO, even the way that people dressed, the way that they presented themselves to local media, it was all about having an all-American and acceptable uh, reputation. Uh, we're a religion, we're not a cult. Um, even the way that India and the United States were played back and forth to each other was all about enhancing reputation. Um, the 
interactions with politicians, with their businesses. It was all about reputation. Um, so I wonder if we can see that as another form of authority. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how clear it was in the presentation, but it, I think it's really important, especially uh, when we talk about reputation. Um, the sannyas order in Gaudiya Vaishnavism is relatively contemporary. And um, in my opinion, it's not a scholarly opinion. I'd have to do more research, but from my impression of what I've heard historically, I believe that it was established, the sannyas order this, of the celibate monks in Saffron is a class and gender-based male supremacy of the celibate order. And that is like the top, like the icing on the cake of the class system. Whereas the Malecha, uh, you know, Western Malechas is the bottom. So, uh, it is a really important, you know, some of this um, classism and um, and male supremacy weighs heavily into those models. So I just wanted to spell that out even more because it is so significant. Well, you've got one minute. Okay. Well, so first of all, I wanted to thank everyone, but particularly uh, Sarah and KD, really appreciate you coming into this space and sharing your experience. Um, I wanted to ask like, whether there was a community of supporters for you and the work that you're doing, like how kind of, what, what's your body of support within, your, within the community? Like, is there a body of support? How did you find each other? To, you know, come on this panel. Yeah, Sarah. Oh, yeah. Um, so KD was doing a campaign to have Dunardar Swami not allowed back into ISKCON, and he was a notorious child abuser. Um, and then when the Lokanath Swami case uh, resurfaced, uh, we just kind of connected naturally because the ISKCON community is relatively small around the world. Um, but yeah, there have been supporters from leaders actually, but they're reluctant to speak openly. They're waiting for the GBC to see what their final decision is, um, as we are also. Um, like just yesterday, I got a phone call from a sannyasi who is also a guru, and he just wanted to tell me that he supports what we're doing, um, and he's a silent supporter. Um, and other people have written me too, um, from ISKCON supporting us. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everyone. I think we'll leave it there as it's time, but, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.